In 1984, Aton Pates became one of the first children to have his face displayed on a milk carton. The six-year-old tragically disappeared on the morning of May 25, 1979, while he was on his way to the school bus in Manhattan. His father began widely distributing images of the boy, hoping to locate someone who had seen the child. Pates's widely publicized disappearance made media headlines and grabbed the nation's attention. Three years ago, a little boy named Aton Pates, just six years old, disappeared on his walk to school. The national headlines of his disappearance frightened an entire nation of parents. Those same concerned parents soon began pushing for a nationwide system to track missing kids, eventually forming the Missing Children Milk Carton Program in 1984. Prior to the Milk Carton campaign, there was no national database of missing children, and once they were taken across state lines, it was almost impossible to track them. While the program began with just a few local dairies in the Midwest printing pictures of missing children on their milk cartons, it was soon adopted nationwide. But missing children didn't just appear on milk cartons in the 1980s. Other tragic, high-profile cases, like the abduction of 13-year-old Johnny Gosh from his paper route in Des Moines, Iowa in 1982, and the kidnapping of six-year-old Adam Walsh from a Sears department store the year before, helped raise the stature of the program. Following these cases, the advocacy of groups like the National Child Safety Council, combined with the subsequent media attention, led to increased efforts to combat child snatching. By 1985, 700 independent dairies across the United States were displaying the faces of missing children on their milk cartons. The trend began to die down just a few years later, however, and by the late 1980s, most milk cartons were no longer featuring the images of missing children. The overall success of the milk carton program was controversial. While it did help raise public awareness, there is not much evidence that proves it significantly increased the number of missing children who were united with their families. There was at least one verified success story, however, that of Bonnie Lohman. Bonnie Lohman was just three years old when her mother and stepfather kidnapped her from the home she shared with her father. Her father contacted the National Child Safety Council and got Bonnie's face included on the milk carton program. Four years later, Bonnie happened to be in a Colorado grocery store with her stepfather when she recognized her own face in the back of the milk carton. According to 99% Invisible, Bonnie's stepfather bought the milk carton with her likeness and allowed her to keep it. When Bonnie left the cutout image along with some toys at her next door neighbor's house, they saw the photo and contacted the authorities. Despite the success, there were several reasons for the program's rapid decline in popularity. Many pediatricians, including the respected child-rearing expert Dr. Benjamin Spock, claimed the images of missing children were emotionally harmful for kids to see every morning, as they increased young people's fear that they would also go missing. Others criticized the campaign's focus on stranger danger, despite strangers making up a very small percentage of kidnappers. Still, others pointed out that the milk cartons disproportionately featured white children, even though children of color make up a larger percentage of the missing child demographic. More practical reasons, such as the dairy industry's transition from cardboard milk cartons to plastic, also contributed to the campaign's demise. With the images of missing children everywhere, people got used to seeing them and no longer looked closely at the faces. And as technology improved over time, quicker and more effective methods were implemented to alert the public about missing children. In 1996, the invention of the Amber Alert system made the milk carton ads obsolete. While the actual effectiveness of the milk carton campaign continues to be debated, there is no doubt that the program significantly raised public awareness of the problem of child abductions and helped give rise to the modern nationwide system of tracking missing children. For Native Americans, putting dinner on the table was a terrifying, oftentimes death-defying, and always full-time job. While many other foods aren't even around anymore, others have cropped up as trending new dining options. This is what Native Americans ate every day before Europeans came. While the Clovis likely weren't the first people to set foot on American soil, they were responsible for some of the earliest settlements. And they were such good hunters, they've been blamed for the mass extinction of one of their favorite meals, the mammoth. The rise of the Clovis does coincide with the downfall of the mammoths, along with other Pleistocene megafauna. Bones found across 19 Clovis sites suggest that while they were eating a lot of mammoth, they were also eating bison, mastodon, deer, rabbits, and caribou. Their diet depended greatly on what was nearby, and megafauna seems to be the overwhelming preference. Clovis hunters in Mexico stalked the gomphotheres. As seen from this small section of a gomphothere jaw, they were massive elephant-like creatures. They also went extinct during this period. In the far north, they hunted something even more surprising, camels. Camels roamed wide sections of what's now Canada until the Clovis likely hunted them to extinction. 
The Folsom people lived in the area of the Great Plains from around 9000 to 8000 BCE. Given the sheer number of knives, blades, and distinct leaf-shaped projectiles they left behind, it's clear they were more hunters than gatherers. The extinction of the mammoth forced later peoples to find something else to hunt, and that new prey ended up being bison. Because bison are faster, lighter, and smaller than mammoths, new technology, like the pointed projectiles used by the Folsom, were developed to make hunting more efficient. The Folsom didn't use spears like the Clovis before them. Instead, they hunted with arrows and darts. The Folsom people were so dependent on bison as a food source, they became migratory, following the great herds across the plains of North America. These bison weren't what we think of today. They were Bison antiquus, a massive, now-extinct ancestor of the modern-day bison. Bison antiquus were 15 feet long, stood 7 feet tall at the shoulder, and had horns with a 3-foot span. Compare these ancient beasts to modern-day bison, which are around 10 feet long, and you'll have a whole new appreciation for the Folsom who hunted these massive creatures with bows and arrows. Somewhere between 7000 and 4500 BCE, the Plano culture emerged. In addition to their diet, which consisted primarily of bison, they were defined by their hunting techniques, traditions, and the development of an innovative food preservation method. The Plano hunted entire herds of bison at a time. They transitioned from hunting a single animal to using a method known as the buffalo jump, where large groups of hunters herded bison off the edge of a cliff. Because of the preservation techniques they invented, the Plano were able to store all of the meat for extended periods of time. The meat was dried in the sun, then mixed with seeds, berries, and fat. They would then pack this mixture into the animal's intestines, making a prehistoric sausage called pemmican. Unfortunately for the Plano, shifts in weather patterns on the plains resulted in the reduction of herd numbers. With fewer bison to hunt, the entire society started to fade, until the Plano people ultimately disappeared forever. The Yurok are a native people that are actually still around in the 21st century. In many respects, they still hold on to their old ways of living. This includes a continued reliance on the same food sources they've utilized for generations. We have a family hole down the way here that my ancestors have fished since the beginning of time. The tribe has traditionally lived on the Klamath River along the coast of California. They have relied on foods like seaweed, mussels, salmon, sturgeon, and candlefish as the backbone of their diet. They've also drawn from the land, hunting deer and elk, but also thriving on acorns, berries, and a variety of teas. The Yurok have even been known to consume banana slugs. Even today, the Yurok still harvest from the same mussel beds and wild salmonberry bushes they have for generations, and they're hoping to teach future generations to do the same. The Poverty Point Heritage Center is located in Louisiana, and it's said that at about the same time Stonehenge was being built, Native Americans were moving around 2 million cubic yards of dirt to build massive mounds, earthworks, and circles. The Poverty Point site was mysteriously abandoned around 1100 BCE, but the earthworks and traces of the builders' everyday lives remained. Most of these native people's food came from the water. Fish was their primary protein source. However, archaeologists have also discovered traces of nuts, aquatic plants, and tubers. And because no signs of agriculture have been discovered at the sites, it's believed that they were strictly hunter-gatherers. Based on the remains discovered in the area, it's likely that the people of Poverty Point hunted freshwater fish, turtles, snakes, alligators, frogs, and small mammals like rabbits and squirrels. Bones of waterfowl such as ducks and geese have also been discovered at many of the sites. The Anasazi are best known for their incredible cave dwellings chiseled out of the rocks in the American Southwest, but they are notable for other reasons as well. These ancient Americans developed a society that helped bridge the gap from being hunter-gatherers to utilizing more modern agricultural technology. Around 1200 BCE, human beings began settling the region of the Southwest. The territory they occupied was large enough to grow crops. At first, they focused on corn, and they didn't just grow it. They selectively crossbred crops in order to create new, hardier varieties. By 500 BCE, the Anasazi were also growing beans and later added squash to their diet. These vegetables were supplemented with the meat from rabbits and deer. It's also worth noting that they were experts at sun-drying their food. Most of their veggies were sun-dried, and in the early years of their society, they would store the results in baskets. As the Anasazi matured, they turned to pottery for their food storage needs. Traditional game and vegetables might not have been the only food the Anasazi fed on. Historical records show signs that the Anasazi eventually started to descend into anarchy. Leadership dispatched squads to keep the peace as villages turned on each other. Eventually, village rivalries turned into massacres that ended in mass slaughter and even cannibalism. These horrors lasted for centuries, even after the arrival of the Spanish. Between 100 BCE and 500 CE, the region of the North American continent that became the USA was dominated by a group of related cultures known collectively as the Hopewell. These Native Americans were also connected to a vast trade network that went all the way into Yellowstone. 
The results of this trading were that while many localities had their own diets, which often included deer, fish, nuts, seeds, and berries, they also had access to goods from other regions. While it's not clear how much was traded and how much was brought in from seasonal migrations, we do know that local goods were often found very far from home. The Yellowstone area, for example, was a source of bighorn sheep and obsidian, while the Great Lakes supplied copper and silver. The Appalachian regions had mica and steatite, much of which was used for tools. This made it possible to carry out the kind of agriculture that allowed mass production of things like tobacco, sunflowers, and knotweed. This was a huge revolution, because the agriculture that defined the Hopewell marked the official shift of Native American culture into full agricultural societies. It's not clear where the Oneota came from, but we do know that they settled along the northern Mississippi River and its tributaries. Given that one of the tools most commonly associated with them are stone scrapers used for cleaning buffalo hides, it's a safe assumption that they hunted a lot of buffalo. The Oneota appeared around 1150 CE and faded away after coming into contact with French trappers. During the height of their society, they survived by hunting bison and deer and occasionally elk. They were also adept at growing corn, beans, and squash. The Oneota relied heavily on plants that are largely considered weeds today. Goosefoot and pigweed were major dietary staples, and though it's not common anymore, they were also known to have eaten dogs. We know all of this because the Oneota stored many of their perishable food staples in deep, bell-shaped pits that were covered with logs and hides to keep scavengers out. This also helped keep the food fresh, and consequently has provided a treasure trove of information to archaeologists. The Fort Walton culture is the name given to the people who flourished around northern Florida and the Mississippi River Delta in the centuries leading up to the European occupation starting around 1200 CE. They emerged after a group called the Whedon Island culture, and for the most part, they gravitated toward living in and around swamps and lakes. One of the things they were particularly good at was making ceramics. Their pottery vessels were tempered with shells, and that was needed for cooking the large amounts of corn that they grew. This corn was different from what we're used to eating today. It was small, with kernels so hard it gained the nickname flint corn. It was mostly used to make hominy, hence the importance of the cooking vessels. Fishing and seafood were also a major part of life, as was something called the black drink. Made from yop and holly, it wasn't made for consumption, but rather for purging the stomach as part of a ritual leading to the eating of green corn. Interestingly, the drink didn't actually induce vomiting. Instead, the vomiting was a learned behavior associated with the drink. When you think of America's prehistoric mound builders, you're probably thinking of the Kaokia. They were at the apex of their power between 1050 and 1200 CE. At the height of their society, the Kaokia Mounds Complex had tens of thousands of residents, and all of those people needed to eat. The Kaokia absolutely revered the hardworking farmers that kept the masses fed. Farmers were respected for good reason, because they cultivated and domesticated crops like the bottle gourd, squash, knotweed, and sunflowers. The Kahokia weren't so different from us in a major way. They absolutely needed their caffeine pick-me-up. Analysis of residue left on Kahokia drinking cups show that they loved casina. Casina is a type of tea made from a native holly that comes with a healthy dose of caffeine. It was so popular that once Europeans did show up, they documented its widespread daily use. In 2017, artist Roxanne Swenzel spoke about a project she'd been working on for a while, a cookbook based on the ancient traditional foods of the Pueblo, updated for a modern audience. She did it in the hope of helping alleviate the pain of some of the chronic health problems plaguing Native Americans of the 21st century. The traditional diet she spoke of consisted of deer, elk, buffalo, antelope, and bighorn sheep. Then there were the plants that were gathered, which included teas, berries, roots, and mushrooms. As far as farming, she utilized ingredients like beans, squash, and corn. Swenzel recruited a group of people who agreed to eat nothing but traditional Pueblo foods for three months. Most of the volunteers had chronic health issues like diabetes and high cholesterol. Their results were impressive, to say the least. We had no idea how successful this would be. Things that the doctors had told us were, couldn't ever be fixed were gone. This is Colonel Sanders' crazy real-life story. Creating the juggernaut that is KFC wasn't the only fascinating thing he did. Here's the man behind the 11 herbs and spices and that iconic white suit. According to a profile in The New Yorker from 1970, Harlan Sanders had a hard go of it from a young age, following his birth outside Henryville, Indiana in 1890. He was raised by an ultra-religious mother who taught him that alcohol, tobacco, coffee, and playing cards were all equally poisonous. 
After his mother got married to a man who wasn't so keen on the idea of stepchildren, so starting at the age of 12, Sanders had to go make his own way in the world. He worked on a farm while going to school, and when that got too hard, he quit school just two weeks into seventh grade. Over the next three decades of his life, he worked as a streetcar conductor and railroad fireman, studied law by mail, acted as a midwife, operated a steamboat ferry, and even more, mostly failing at all these things. In the meantime, Sanders got married at age 18 and had three children. As Sanders' autobiography recounts, after Sanders got fired from the railroad, his wife left and went to her parents in Alabama. Sanders planned and failed to kidnap his own children, and instead reluctantly reconciled with his wife. The couple would eventually divorce nearly 40 years later. Harland Sanders' life would change at age 40 when he began selling food to travelers from the back room of the Shell gas station he ran in Corbin, Kentucky. As history points out, he became a hit with travelers selling his simple country fare of country ham, okra, biscuits, string beans, and other similar items as an alternative to the typical diner food found along the highways. Ironically, fried chicken was not originally on the menu. It took too long to prepare to be able to keep up with demand. Sanders would advertise the food at his Shell station by painting giant signs on barns in the area. This clever marketing scheme greatly upset Matt Stewart, the operator of a nearby competing Standard Oil station. Stewart began painting over Sanders' signs, so Sanders went to pay him a visit along with two Shell district managers. What they weren't expecting was that Stewart had a gun, with which he shot and killed one of the managers. Sanders had his own gun and returned fire, wounding Stewart in the shoulder. Stewart went to prison for murder, and charges against Sanders were dropped, leaving him the gas station king of Kentucky. If you know one thing about Colonel Sanders, it's probably that he made chicken. But if you know a second thing, well, it's that he's a colonel. Heck, you might even think Colonel is his first name. Certainly more people could name Colonel Sanders than Harlan Sanders. But while it's true that Harlan Sanders did serve in the army, he wasn't that kind of colonel. As history relates, he lied about his age to join the army in 1906 at age 15 or 16. He served in Cuba for about six months before he was honorably discharged, possibly because his young age was discovered. Suffice it to say, this was not enough time for him to ascend to the rank of colonel. So what gives? In fact, Harlan Sanders was a Kentucky colonel, which is the highest honorary title bestowed by the governor of Kentucky, a distinction later held by Muhammad Ali and Bob Barker. Sanders was declared a colonel by Governor Ruby Lapoon in 1935, and then got re-upped in 1949 because his chicken was just that good. Not one to miss a marketing opportunity, Colonel Sanders made it a whole thing. It's the only way that you're going to get chicken that is finger-licking good. Fried chicken wasn't on Colonel Sanders' early menu because 30 minutes was too long to wait for a serving to cook. Then in 1935, Sanders had probably the most important breakthrough in chicken history. He began frying his chicken in a pressure cooker, which dramatically cut the cook time while preserving quality. What's more, by this time, Sanders was refining his famous blend of 11 herbs and spices, and the combination was ready for explosive success. And just in time, too. In 1935, Sanders' first post-gas station cafe had been named a must-see destination in Duncan Hines' travel guide, Adventures in Good Eating. Like Sanders, it's interesting to note Duncan Hines was a real guy, unlike Betty Crocker. Sanders was now nationally famous and had expanded his back room in a gas station kitchen into a 142-seat restaurant. It seemed like finally at age 49, after a host of weird jobs and shootouts, Sanders had found success. As it turns out, he hadn't seen anything yet. But at first, he had to deal with some bad news. In the early 1950s, Colonel Sanders suffered a couple of career setbacks. As explained by The New Yorker, the highway junction that ran in front of his cafe was moved, and then a new interstate highway was built that took traffic away from his location entirely. After a decade of success, it looked like Sanders was done for. In 1956, he auctioned off his business at a huge loss and was now, at age 65, living entirely on his savings and a social security check of $105 a month. Fortunately, franchising would be a saving grace. According to history, Sanders taught his chicken frying method methods to friend Pete Harmon in Salt Lake City. As it happens, Harmon owned one of the largest restaurants in town, and he started selling Sanders Chicken as his first ever franchisee, calling it Kentucky Fried Chicken and selling it in the soon-to-be trademark bucket. Following Harmon's success, other businesses wanted to sell Sanders Chicken and made arrangements to give him four cents for every chicken cooked via his process. Sanders hopped in his 1946 Ford and drove around the country, sleeping in his car with pressure cookers and a bag of spices, looking far and wide for franchisees and finding them everywhere. By 1963, Sanders had over 600 restaurants in the United States and Canada selling his chicken. Pete Harmon would be an extremely important contributor to Colonel Sanders' increasing success. According to Smithsonian Magazine, in addition to coming up with the name Kentucky Fried Chicken, being Sanders' first franchisee and selling via bucket, the phrase finger licking good and the idea of standalone KFC restaurants came courtesy of Harmon. Harmon alone would own more than 300 KFC franchises in Utah, California, Nevada, and Washington. But despite being basically the co-founder of the franchise, it's not his face on the bucket. That's okay, though. The colonel made him a millionaire. <laughs> 
The Colonel himself became a millionaire in 1964 at age 73, when he sold Kentucky Fried Chicken to a group of investors for $2 million. The New Yorker says he was reluctant at first, but the investors persuaded him by saying they would never tamper with his recipe and that he could stay with the company as an advisor and brand ambassador, the living face of the company. The new owners felt having a living, authentic company symbol was a great asset, and they were right. Soon, the Colonel was making appearances on The Tonight Show and Merv Griffin, as well as a seemingly endless number of television commercials and other advertisements, with KFC spending $24 million on advertising in 1970, compared to half a million in 1964. A big part of the Colonel's success as an advertising icon was his trademark look. As history explains, after his second commission as a Kentucky Colonel in 1949, he decided to really lean into the whole Southern gentleman thing. Sanders grew out his facial hair and started wearing a string tie. At first, he wore a black frock coat, but switched to his iconic all-white suit after realizing it hit flower stains much better. Additionally, he started bleaching his mustache and goatee so they'd match his naturally white hair. As Colonel Sanders biographer Josh Ozersky wrote for Time, Sanders actually called himself Colonel and had others do the same. He wore his white suit every day, and indeed, it was the only thing he wore in public for the last 20 years of his life, and not just for advertisements or TV appearances. He had a light cotton version he wore in summer and a heavy wool version he wore in the winter. The suit has become so iconic that suits actually owned and worn by the Colonel can sell at auction for up to $80,000. Furthermore, the suit and facial hair are enough to make actors as diverse as Daryl Hammond, Norm MacDonald, Jim Gaffigan, George Hamilton, Rob Riggle, and Billy Zane recognizable as the Colonel. Colonel Sanders remained the symbol of the company and traveled 200,000 miles a year, making appearances on television and at the company's franchises. Colonel Sanders, what are you doing in Chicago? Oh, I'm here just for a short while. Even so, Sanders came to hate the changes the company made after he was no longer in charge. The New Yorker reported Sanders dreamed of gravy so good, quote, it'll make you throw away the darn chicken and just eat the gravy. However, the gravy made by post-Sanders franchisees was decidedly not the Colonel's gravy. A company executive was quoted as saying, let's face it, the Colonel's gravy was fantastic, but you had to be a Rhodes Scholar to cook it, which was probably code for too expensive. The Colonel didn't care for such changes to his recipe and wasn't shy about letting people know it, despite his job as brand ambassador. He would visit franchises, and if the gravy wasn't up to his standards, he would throw the food on the floor and call it, quote, goddamn slop. Worse, in an interview in the Louisville Courier Journal, he referred to the gravy as pure wallpaper paste made with tap water, flour, and starch, to which they add, quote, some sludge. He further said that the then new crispy recipe was nothing in the world but a damned fried dough ball stuck on some chicken. His criticism of KFC was so harsh that the company he founded sued him for libel in 1978. The case was thrown out, but if you think that's the end of the story, don't worry, it happened again. Suffice it to say that Colonel Sanders was not happy with the changes made to his chicken and gravy recipes in the name of savings and streamlining for thousands of franchises. Can you imagine the glorious explosion of rage that would cover this land if the Colonel were to appear today and see a Go Cup or a Double Down? In the 1970s, however, when Sanders was now in his 80s, his solution was somewhat different. He and his once mistress, now wife Claudia, opened a new competing restaurant that served food that rose to the Colonel's standards. As reported in People magazine, the restaurant, known as Claudia Sanders, the Colonel's Lady Dinner House, would sell sit-down style dinners of ham and lobster in addition to chicken. Sanders attempted to expand this business into a chain as well, but KFC wasn't thrilled about that and sued them to the tune of $120 million. According to Uprox, the suit was settled for $1 million and Sanders sold the restaurant. The Claudia Sanders Dinner House still exists, though, and you can visit it right off of I-64 east of Louisville. It's the only non-KFC restaurant that sells a fully authorized version of the original Colonel Sanders fried chicken recipe. Sanders died in 1980 at age 90 of acute leukemia. He kept working until a month before his death. Flags were flown at half-staff for his funeral, which was attended by over 1,000 people. That seems like it should be the end of his story. Outside debates about the propriety of his image being used in continued advertising after his death, but for some Japanese baseball fans, the colonel's death was only the beginning. Here's the short version of the story as reported by NBC News. Osaka's baseball team, the Hanshin Tigers, won the national championship in 1985. Tigers fans often jumped in Osaka's Dotonbury River to celebrate wins. After the championship, some rowdy fans decided that a statue of Colonel Sanders outside a local KFC looked enough like the Tigers' American first baseman Randy Bass that he should go in the river too. So they threw the statue in the river. Since that time, fans feel the team has been plagued by the curse of the Colonel, which is to say the Tigers have not won another championship. The statue was recovered from the river in 2009, but it had deteriorated pretty significantly in 24 years. The colonel was missing his legs, hands, and glasses when pulled from the murky waters of the Dotonbury. The legs and right hand were recovered the next day, but the left hand and glasses are still missing. 
Tigers fans assert it is because of these still missing pieces that the curse is still in place. Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll, was famous for his love of sweet and savory foods. But there's one he disliked so much it affected his life in and out of Graceland. Though Elvis was one of America's greatest heartthrobs in his younger years, his fame and fortune ultimately led to a dependence on food. Mary Jenkins Langston, Presley's chef for 14 years, told the BBC, he said that the only thing in life he got any enjoyment out of was eating, and he liked his food real rich. I'm gonna get some of those ribs. That rehearsal it made me hungry. According to People, Elvis turned to comfort food after his extreme popularity drove him to isolation, forcing him to stop going out in public. As he struggled to lose excess weight with extreme diets, the musician turned to drugs. Tragically, things spiraled out of control, and in 1977, Elvis died at just 42 years old. At the time of his death, Elvis reportedly weighed 255 pounds, in large part due to those rich foods that he loved. According to the Los Angeles Times, the king's favorite foods included fried peanut butter and banana sandwiches, bacon-wrapped meatballs, fried chicken with potato chip coating, jelly donuts, chicken fried steak, and vegetables saturated with butter and salt. It all came from his love of southern home cooking. According to Graceland archivist Angie Marchese, Elvis grew up on good old southern food. He loved meatloaf, mashed potato, fried chicken, mac and cheese. Anything that he grew up on were some of his favorites. In Graceland, Elvis Presley's sprawling mansion in Memphis, where he lived for two decades, was well-stocked at all times. The food items stuffed in its refrigerator 24-7 included sausages, eggs, hamburger buns, potatoes, peanut butter, milk, cream, and bacon. According to his ex-wife Priscilla Presley, he loved meatloaf and mashed potatoes so much that he ate the same meal every day for dinner for six months. Author Albert Goldman wrote in his book Elvis, his favorite feed consists of a pound of Dixie cotton bacon fried to a crisp, a quadruple order of mashed potatoes brimming with thickening gravy, a large portion of sauerkraut, a dish of crowded peas, and a stack of sliced tomatoes. But as much as he loved some foods, he equally loathed others, and there were a couple of foods in particular that Elvis hated so much that he banned them from Graceland. Chief among them, fish. Marchese said he didn't like the smell of fish being cooked in the house. There was never any fish in the house. Apparently, it wasn't just fish or the smell of fish that Elvis disliked. He didn't like to go fishing either. Presley's cousin, Billy Smith, said in a YouTube video that he could never get Presley to go fishing. He just wouldn't do it. I can only remember him going fishing twice, really, and that was just briefly. Most of the time, he just sat around and walked up and down. He wouldn't fish. And aside from hating fish, Elvis also loathed the taste and smell of onion. Smith shared on YouTube his memories of the iconic actor-singer's disdain for the vegetable. Smith said that he had eaten a hamburger with onions, and knowing of Elvis's hate for onions, he was careful to brush his teeth before going to Graceland. But it wasn't enough. Elvis sniffed it out and said, I want you to quit eating onion. I said, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Elvis also didn't like using silverware or glasses that other people had used before. In a 2015 interview on The Jonathan Ross Show, Presley's former wife Priscilla told Ross that her ex-husband didn't like using glasses or silverware that other people had used, which resulted in him taking his own silverware with him just about everywhere. She explained that Presley was this way even when he was younger, explaining that, in her opinion, he simply didn't like putting his mouth where other people had placed their mouths. And when you're the king, you can get things the way you want. Better luck next time, fish. The surprising bird that used to be consumed. The pricey delicacy that was more common. The most popular place in town to get the best food. Keep watching to find the most popular foods eaten in the 13 original colonies. When it comes to popular foods in the 13 original colonies, everything begins and ends with corn. Yes, the stereotypical idea of corn being eaten in the colonies was actually true, as this is one myth your elementary school books didn't exaggerate. The technique of growing corn was taught to settlers by the Native Americans in a watershed moment that essentially saved the colonists from starvation. Corn quickly became the first bedrock of American agricultural practice. Once the craft was mastered, corn quickly was made a staple in colonial cooking and a key part of the colonial economy. Once indigenous leaders like Squanto had taught the colonists how to grow corn and use it to make cornmeal, it provided common ground for two societies struggling to come together. It's corn is special, isn't it? Corn, I love good corn. All 13 colonies used the crop for cornmeal, an ingredient that held various dishes together such as johnny cakes, which are basically cornmeal pancakes, and hasty pudding, 
a porridge made with corn that was cooked in water or preferably milk. These dishes were enjoyed by everybody in colonial society and are still being made today. Not everything that was killed, harvested, or bought in the colonies was to be eaten right away. Much of it needed to be stored away for the long, cold winters, something that became all too clear to the soldiers trapped in Valley Forge during the Revolutionary War. Three days successively we have been without bread. Two days we have been entirely without meat. But in a time before refrigeration, how did the colonists preserve food? One answer comes in the form of potted meat. Potted meat was essentially cuts and parts of various animals that were lightly cooked and tightly sealed in a jar with butter or lard, allowing its shelf life to last for months. When ready to eat, the potted meat could be unsealed and served up, becoming a popular dish throughout the original 13 colonies. That wasn't the only way to extend shelf life of food during the colonial times. D.M. Kinsman wrote in a report called Meat Preparation and Preservation in Colonial America that meat could also be preserved through the three S's, salt, smoke, and snow. With survival on the line, the colonists had to use what they had around them, with potted meat being just one of the resulting delicacies. Another method of preservation that influenced the dinner table was the long-standing tradition of pickling food. This involved placing either fruits, vegetables, or meat inside wooden barrels or casks that were filled with brine. Pickled foods went hand-in-hand -hand with potted or preserved meats at the dinner table and were often seasoned with simple spices and salt. Pickling was a process that provided comfort in times of food shortages or poor seasons, and it was also delicious. According to the History Channel, Dutch farmers in New York started growing cucumbers in the 1650s. Their crops were then pickled and sold by dealers on the street, marking the beginnings of the pickle industry, which still thrives today. They weren't just making food, they were also making money. It's the American way. It wasn't all salty meat and pickled vegetables in the colonies, though. Jumbo cookies, along with a host of other English sweet recipes, were also brought over and adopted into the New World. Jumbo cookies are believed to have come across on the Mayflower, eventually spreading into other areas of America. Martha Washington, the first lady to President George Washington, even had her own special jumbo cookie recipe, which consisted mostly of eggs, flour, sugar, milk, and maybe some caraway seeds. The Jumbo Cookie is a perfect example of how the 13 colonies built upon their roots from England to make recipes that took on an American flavor over time. In spite of America's puritanical roots, all 13 colonies consumed a variety of different forms of alcohol and found numerous ways to produce it. Some of these methods included crushing apples and fermenting them into hard cider, or turning corn into whiskey, which is still a practice done to this day and has been perfected through the distillation of bourbon. Aside from utilizing local ingredients such as corn and apples to make alcoholic drinks, the colonies relied on the importation of certain goods in order to widen the palate of accessible alcohol. For instance, molasses was often used to create rum, which had its downside when it came to wartime. A lot of them were drunk, just putting them on boats, and people are like falling off face trying to get it. It's just fun. Perhaps most interestingly, there is evidence that honey was used to make methaglin in the New World, which was originally a Welsh-spiced mead. Since almost all of the original American colonies were along the coast of the Atlantic Ocean, it's no wonder that there were strong seafood influences in their diet. The fishing was plentiful. Anything from sturgeon, seals, flounder, herring, and more were common catches for colonialists. But codfish was by far the most popular to be caught, cooked, and sold. According to colonial New England recipes, a famous and widely used technique was baking the codfish with various vegetables and herbs like onions and thyme. The codfish found itself not only on New Englanders' dinner tables, but also being shipped for exportation, which ended up inadvertently helping to win the Revolutionary War. You see, codfish was by far the biggest export from the 13 colonies to other countries, and that meant a fleet of ships, mostly fishing and commercial vessels, were needed to support the trade. So, when the war broke out, John Adams saw a naval opportunity. Soon, those fishing fleets had been transformed into America's young navy. Codfish wasn't just useful in war, though. It also had an effect on religion as well. Once codfish was dried, it became around 80% protein, which made it the perfect food for Catholic countries in Europe to import from the colonies during periods of religious fasting. Ultimately, the codfish supplied food, money, and eventually a navy for the American people, making it a very important bit of food indeed. One popular recipe that relied more heavily on imported ingredients was pepper cake. It primarily used pepper as a preservative and molasses as a sweetening agent. And it didn't just taste good. Importantly, it was also easy to preserve, lasting for months or even over a year before going stale. 
Think of the toughest gingerbread man you can imagine, and that is pepper cake. So just exactly how is this immortal molasses-filled cake concocted? Well, once again, we have Martha Washington to thank here, as she passed down a recipe for pepper cake that she originally received in 1749 during her first marriage. The recipe includes such interesting elements as ginger, coriander, caraway, and aniseed. Food in the 13 colonies had to do more than taste good, it had to last. Pepper cake is an all-star of everything a colonialist was looking for in food. Inhabitants of all 13 colonies relied heavily on the dense amounts of wild game found in the vast forests of the New World for a source of fresh food. Wild game was often the main dish, satiating the colonial appetite, as Americans hunted animals such as deer, rabbit, turkey, and even pigeon in droves. This created a largely meat-based diet for the colonies. They killed what they could and ate what they would. In regards to a more modern diet, pigeon certainly sticks out from the rest of the usual game. One reason it's so unusual now is that the main type of pigeon people used to eat, the passenger pigeon, was hunted into total extinction. Colonial Americans enjoyed eating this bird in many ways, including roasting it, baking it, adding it to a stew, or even sticking it into a pie. Once the bird went extinct due to overhunting, the chicken replaced it on the dinner table and in the American marketplace. Another plentiful source of food for the colonists was lobster. In fact, according to history, there were so many lobsters when the first settlers came to America that they washed up ashore in droves, nearing piles that reached up to two feet high. The fact that they were so plentiful made lobster an ideal food for the poor, and when difficult seasonal droughts reduced the supply of other foods. Native Americans utilized lobsters to fertilize their crops, and they also cooked and ate them alongside seaweed. As for the colonists, eventually the number of lobsters literally washing ashore wasn't enough, so they developed fishing boats called smacks that were specifically designed for catching lobsters. The men who ran these boats were known as smackmen and pulled in such large amounts of lobster that the 13 colonies didn't know what to do with it. So what they ended up deciding on was to feed lobsters to slaves, prisoners, and indentured servants. In fact, it became so common that before coming to America, some servants would stipulate that they could only be given a certain amount of lobster. Yes, it's hard to believe given lobster is considered a delicacy nowadays, but once upon a time it was considered only fit for societies poor and downtrodden. As the colonies developed, taverns popped up all over the rugged landscape, offering warmth and reprieve from the taxing traveling conditions of the time. Taverns also served many purposes within a town or city, as they became a hub for sharing ideas and political organization. But there was another major reason customers kept coming back to taverns across early America, the delicious food. According to the National Woman's History Museum, even colonists wanted fast food. One could expect a variety of dishes served at their preferred tavern. These quick bites typically included bacon, ham, and other pork products, as they were fast, cheap, and easy to preserve. Hot biscuits were also certainly a popular tavern menu item, and things like shepherd's pie are still served in those colonial taverns that have survived to today. There's a shepherd's pie and a bubble and squeak, the early American answer for leftovers. The Colonial Williamsburg Tavern Cookbook by former Colonial Williamsburg executive chef John Gonzalez also details some fantastic tavern dishes of the colonial era, and perhaps more importantly, how to make them. Gonzalez reveals that taverns sold sweet potato muffins, steaks stuffed with oysters, and for dessert, chocolate pecan pie. Now that sounds like a recipe for a great Yelp review. Alcohol and dessert all in one? Sounds too good to be true, but welcome to the wonder that is syllabub. There were many ways to make syllabub, but there were always two key ingredients, sugar and wine. This dish was literally whipped up for special occasions, containing whipped cream and some kind of citrus for acidity. Syllabub relied on that combination, plus alcohol, to create a dessert that kept an individual coming back for another bite. It was a delicacy well known throughout the 13 colonies, often served as a centerpiece inside elegantly stacked glasses. If you're looking to throw an old-fashioned 18th century party, Amelia Simmons' American Cookery is a must. It offers a host of syllabub recipes, ranging from whipped raspberry cream to lemon cream in order to recreate popular variations of this colonial classic. Each list of ingredients calls for a heavy pour of booze to be sure one catches a delicious buzz as well. Nobody wants to eat bland food, not even colonists, so they figure out ways to spice things up, literally. According to the Union Forge Heritage Association, a colonial garden would have included things like basil, sage, caraway chives, and dill, to name a few. 
These herbs were used for cleaning purposes and at times were applied medicinally, but mainly they were used to add flavors to pies, spiced meats, and soups. Colonists were also able to use plant life for a range of things like tea and balm. According to the Daily Progress, when Americans boycotted British teas, they turned to local indigenous tribes to learn brewing methods, like with the wild bergamot mint. Many of the base herbs were used to season meat and added to salads, and oils were extracted for cooking. And for those colonists who could afford them, other herbs and spices were imported to satisfy those looking to cook beyond the typical colony fare, or for those who couldn't maintain a garden due to colder weather. These simple but practical applications of herbs added an important flavor identity to the colonial diets and shaped what we still eat today. Medieval peasants didn't exactly have it easy. Aside from the endless wars, the abject poverty, and the occasional plague, they had to get by on a relatively meager diet. But just what did they actually rustle up for dinner? Here's what medieval peasants really ate in a day. Here's a question. How does anyone actually know what peasants ate in the medieval era? After all, it's not like peasants were keeping detailed records of their daily lives. In fact, it's been estimated that, even in the later years of the Middle Ages, only around 10% of men and 1% of women were literate. And those that were literate weren't really writing about their breakfast, lunch, or dinner, so researchers have had to get creative. For example, in 2019, a study published in the Journal of Archaeological Science took samples of medieval pottery from West Cotton, Northamptonshire, and analyzed the residue left inside. The molecular analysis allowed them to put together a picture of what was cooked inside. What did they find? Well, the staples were meat, mostly sheep and cattle, as well as cabbage stews cooked in the pots over an open hearth. There were also a lot of dairy products, which the study notes were affectionately referred to as white meats of the poor. A few years ago, English Heritage followed a reenactor as she made a traditional medieval stew, and it'll actually look pretty familiar to 21st century cooks. Meat was first browned over an open fire, then transferred to a large dish. Carrots, onions, and any other available veg were added, as well as a little cider. It was sometimes seasoned with whatever herbs could be foraged, then barley was added too, a staple grain in peasant diets. That was then left to cook over an open fire or a hearth. Doesn't sound so awful, does it? It's important to know that there wasn't just one kind of peasant. For example, while many lived in small villages or on farms, as you might expect, others lived in large cities. And according to Radford University anthropology professor Cassidy Yoder, where you lived made a huge difference when it came to what you were eating. Yoder has studied the diets of medieval peasants from three places. Reba, Denmark's largest medieval city, the mid-sized metropolis of Vyborg, and a small rural community around a Cistercian monastery. Interestingly, her findings showed that the people with the most varied diet were those who lived near the rural monastery. They didn't have much in the way of meat, but they did eat a variety of cereal grains and vegetables. On the other hand, the peasants of Reba and Vyborg had a more narrow range of foods, but their diets were much higher in meat and protein, mainly a lot of fish, pigs, and cows. Butter has been around for a long time. Well, over 4,000 years, in fact. Take Ireland, a country still known for its butter. Before refrigeration, the ancient Irish had a massive dairy industry and stored butter in containers buried in bogs. Surviving samples have been found dating back to 1700 BC and can even still be edible, if you're brave enough. You must not partake of the sacred butter that was gifted to the gods of yore. <laughs> Fast forward to the Middle Ages, and butter was still extremely important to every social class. While it was a treat for some, it was a necessity for others, as it helped stave off malnutrition. That was especially true for the penitents, those who kept a strict bread and water diet to demonstrate their faith. Malnutrition and death were widespread among the penitents until church officials started telling of a vision of an angel who had visited a saint praying for guidance. The angel had told them to mix a meal with their butter to make gruel so that the penitents should not perish. Bottom line, the nobility loved it because of the taste and the peasants loved it because it was a cheap, widely available source of nutrition. One of the most commonly held assertions about the medieval era is that people tended to drink a lot of beer because it was safer than drinking the water. 
But that's not actually true, according to food historian Jim Chevalier. Chevalier did his own deep dive into the claim and found that not much of it stands up to scrutiny. For starters, there are a ton of references in medieval texts to people drinking water. They range from one writer's description of water in Italy, as clear, without odor, and cold, to excerpts like ones from Gregory of Tours, who wrote in the 6th century about a man arriving in his village and asking for some water. Gregory also writes about hermits drinking from streams and says that water was far from feared. Instead, it was more often linked with holy figures and miraculous cures, and some texts from the 14th century even recommended drinking only water. Some people, such as the Gauls, did prefer to drink water that had been run through a beehive and slightly sweetened. The medical authorities of the medieval era also issued some warnings about water, but they tended to advise that people not drink water that looks unsafe or unhealthy, which seems obvious, but is also solid advice. If it was cold, clear, and didn't have a funky smell, then it was absolutely fine to drink. Unsurprisingly, peasants in the medieval era didn't have quite the variety of drinks we had today. That said, they weren't actually too bad off. At the very least, they had more available than beer, water, and wine. Mead was popular in some areas, and there's also the occasional mention of fruit juices in contemporary sources. Apples were commonly used in ciders, which were sometimes alcoholic and sometimes not, and could occasionally be flavored with various types of berries. More surprisingly, medieval Franks were also drinking vermouth, as the art of making wine from wormwood had been passed down from Rome. Tonics were also common, especially among monks, as perfectly common natural ingredients could be easily infused into the water. There was also the occasional mention of hot drinks, which were often medicinal and could range from anything like warm goat's milk to teas made from barley, chamomile, and lavender. Life in the medieval era was invariably difficult, and sometimes tough times called for drastic measures. So to answer the question you dared not ask, yes, there was cannibalism. There's a lot about medieval cannibalism we don't know, but there are plenty of references scattered through old texts that imply peasants resorted to cannibalism in times of extreme hardship, such as during famines. For instance, there's one report that English markets in the 11th century had human flesh for sale. Did they really? Honestly, it's hard to tell, but we do know that cannibalism during the Crusades was reported in multiple independent sources, giving at least that one some greater credence. Even at the time, people weren't generally thrilled with the idea that folks might be partaking in human flesh. Still, medieval history is dotted with stories of desperation. In 1594, those under siege in Paris resorted to making bread from the bones of their dead, and during the European famines of the early 14th century, there were numerous reports of cannibalism. It has even been suggested that those particular instances inspired the Brothers Grimm to write the tale of Hansel and Gretel 500 years later. Deer farming in medieval England was a pretty huge deal. Deer parks were sustainably managed sections of wilderness that supported massive herds of not only deer but other wildlife too. These vast parks were managed by the upper classes, who were legally the only ones who could hunt there. And they did. Indeed, deer was an important source of meat, and it wasn't just a matter of hunting the deer that happened to be on your land. It was an entire industry, and had a lot in common with sheep or cattle farming. That said, venison was supposed to be reserved for that same upper class and their guests. Anyone who broke that law could find themselves quickly repressed. Ah, now we see the violence inherent in the system. Shut up! Oh, come and see the violence inherent in the system! Help, help, I'm being repressed! But that doesn't mean the rules actually stopped people from eating deer themselves. Evidence of poaching has certainly been uncovered, like the cesspit uncovered in Northern England in 2008. Excavation of this pit uncovered more than a hundred bones, all belonging to fallow deer and dating back to the 15th century. Given the size, they were mostly young animals, which meant they were killed outside of the accepted winter hunting season. Given the lack of meat bones and the presence of more bones like the legs, archaeologists came to the conclusion that it was the work of peasants, who had poached the deer, taken the meatiest parts, and buried the evidence in hopes of avoiding the law. Bloody peasant! Oh, what a giveaway! Do you hear that? Do you hear that, eh? That's what I'm on about. Do you see him repressing me? You saw it, didn't you? Luckily, it wasn't all doom and gloom for people in the medieval era, and there was one bright spot in the year. 
And medieval people didn't just celebrate Christmas either. They celebrated all 12 days between Christmas and Epiphany. During that time, there was usually at least one big Christmas feast, even for the peasants. While they weren't dining on the meat and sweet treats the upper class had, it was still a time to enjoy things that were otherwise in short supply through the winter months. Those typically included foods like salted fish, dried apples, and vegetables such as peas and beans, and meats like bacon and sausage. Depending on where you lived and how amenable your lord was, this was also a time that pheasants got a genuine taste of the high life. Leftovers from the manor hall feast were often distributed among the poor, giving them a taste of exotic dishes like peacock, swan, and desserts that had been made with a very rare ingredient indeed, sugar. As historic royal palaces tells us, there's a popular belief that during the medieval era, spices were often used to mask the smell and taste of rotten meat. Makes sense, right? But it's not true. See, there's one big flaw in that tale. During the Middle Ages, spices were well known, but they were also imported from the Far East at a truly massive cost. This means only the very rich could afford them, and not only were the wealthy not eating rotten meat, but they wouldn't have wasted spices on them if they had. People were also quite familiar with the idea that eating bad meat could make you sick, and it wasn't something they would voluntarily do. They may not have known about things like microbes and bacterial contamination, but they knew it was bad to eat something that had gone off. The solution? Peasants would just make sure their meat didn't go bad in the first place by salting, drying, or smoking it. The peasants in medieval cities in particular had it rough. Many were living in crowded conditions and didn't have access to what they needed to cook their own food, so they relied on what was essentially medieval fast food. What does that mean? Well, there was one area on the Thames, for example, that was essentially a group of shops that were open 24-7 and sold a variety of foodstuffs at all different price points. The urban peasant could expect to find items such as meat pies, pasties, bread, pancakes, hotcakes, wafers, and, well, more pies. Why were pies so popular? Because they contained plenty of ingredients in one handy pocket and could therefore be eaten on the go. But there was a major problem. Unscrupulous vendors quickly discovered that they could hide all kinds of things in pies and no one would know the difference until it was too late. Customers would pay, leave, and get food poisoning pretty shortly after. But by then, it wasn't the vendor's problem. Laws were subsequently put in place against the selling of diseased or rotten meat, reheating pies, and against claiming meat was something that it wasn't. And that gave rise to a medieval saying, God sends the meat, but the devil sends the cooks. Cleopatra had the seductive power to make men eat their hearts out and the destructive prowess to make her siblings bite the dust, but she also had a pretty full plate herself. When she wasn't busy feasting on Caesar's salad, she had a massive empire to manage. As life science describes, her queendom spanned Egypt and Cyprus plus sections of present-day Libya and other Middle Eastern regions. She had to grapple with a lethal sibling rivalry and joined her lover Mark Antony in a losing battle against Caesar's assassins during the Roman Civil War. That's a lot to handle, but ultimately, Antony and Cleopatra bit off more than they could chew, and an asp allegedly bit the fabled pharaoh. But what did Cleopatra herself usually bite into? We know from legend that on at least one occasion, she had consumed a gigantic pearl just to show off how rich she was. According to the histories of Pliny the Elder, Cleopatra found Antony's penchant for decadently overeating to be so distasteful that she bet she could best his extravagance at a banquet. She achieved this by dissolving a half-million-dollar pearl in vinegar and drinking the remains. Before she could consume any more treasures of antiquity, though, she was declared the winner. That story is probably untrue, and even if it were true, we know that Cleopatra didn't just live off of pearls alone. So what was her usual diet? According to history, bread and beer were the bread and butter of the ancient Egyptian diet. While regular Egyptians were also hungry for hippo meat, fish, cranes, hedgehog, and gazelles. Cleopatra wasn't a regular Egyptian, though, as her family was actually Greek. Plus, she was rich, queen of a kingdom kind of rich. Her breakfast likely consisted of wine-soaked wheat or barley bread with olives. For lunch, she'd munch on something light, and dinner would probably be a sumptuous feast. She probably had plenty of lentil soup or pâté on her daily menu. Given her family's roots, her mouth might have watered for onions, garlic, and cheese. 
When she felt like dining on the animal kingdom, her plate probably included porcupine, quail, gazelle, goat, or ox meat. And then there's figs. Hi, gang! <laughs> Big Fig here. The BBC describes figs as a mainstay of Egyptian agriculture. Farmers used to train monkeys to harvest them. Pharaohs were buried with dried figs to feed them in the afterlife. And according to legend, a meal of figs with a side of deadly, venomous snake sent Cleopatra to the great beyond. In Shakespeare's famous play, Antony and Cleopatra, the monarch is killed by an asp nestled inside a basket of figs. In truth, the nature of Cleopatra's death was a mystery even to her contemporaries. The Greek writer Plutarch posited that she poisoned herself with a hollow comb and the Roman writer Dio reasoned that a snake bit her. And some versions of her death claim she didn't receive a basket of figs, but of flowers. So, where did the fig thing come from? Well, many historians believe it may have been a sexist smear campaign aimed at ruining her reputation after death. See, the Romans associated figs with fertility. Per the Encyclopedia Britannica, they held a March celebration of the goddess of childbirth under a wild fig tree. Romans also referred to an obscene hand gesture as the fig hand, monofico, because they thought it resembled a woman's privates. In fact, the Italian word for fig doubles as slang for the female genitals. According to the University of Chicago, it's possible that accounts of Cleopatra's death that mention figs are meant to discredit her by casting her as a wanton seductress rather than a powerful ruler worthy of respect. In fact, there's also the possibility that the legend of the pearl was attributed to Cleopatra for the same reason, as pearls were associated with Venus, the Roman goddess of love. So, first they kill her and then they smear her reputation for all time? That's pretty tough to swallow. And it doesn't sound like just desserts. Sounds like her enemies were full of it. Most people know that Abraham Lincoln grew up with modest means, moving around with his family from his birthplace of Kentucky to the wilderness of Indiana and on to Illinois. Even after bucking all the odds to go on to be America's 16th president with a fully staffed kitchen though, his taste in food was simple and humble. In her 2014 book, Abraham Lincoln in the Kitchen, a culinary view of Lincoln's life and times, Ray Catherine Amy explains that Lincoln learned to cook for himself and his family at a young age because someone had to do it after his mother died when he was just nine years old. According to Amy, he continued being helpful in the kitchen after he was grown and married, tying on a blue apron after a day of working in the law office and helping his wife cook dinner. President Lincoln's Cottage tells us that he also loved foods such as oysters, baked beans, and gingerbread cookies. But as time went on and Lincoln's responsibilities grew to include being the head of a country split by the Civil War, his appetite lessened, his weight dropped, and very few victuals could tempt him away from his work. Breakfast was just an egg, toast, and milk or coffee, and lunch was even more austere, often just an apple or biscuit with milk. And despite what you may have seen, he wasn't known to loudly eat popcorn and candy at the theater. Stick it here, pal! Hey, I'm sorry, hey, I'm sorry pal! Look, send me a cleaning bill! To my Gettysburg address! Ah! It's interesting to view Lincoln's presidency through the lens of food. After all, food is a tether to both our humanity and our culture. And according to Lincoln Cottage, the Lincoln family's practicality showed through despite the pomp of the office. For instance, Mary Todd Lincoln reportedly sent frequent gifts of food to local hospitals, including highly desirable items the couple would have had access to, like citrus fruits, that may not have been available to everyone. While many of us react to life's stresses by eating too much, Lincoln seemed to be a person more inclined to skip meals, particularly as the war raged on. His wife, Mary, becoming concerned about his lack of appetite, often asked anyone in close proximity in the White House to join the family for a meal, banking on Lincoln's amenable nature to compel him to leave his work and join his guests for dinner. On the occasions where Lincoln could be tempted to the table, he hoped to see the simple country foods he liked. Yes, Lincoln liked his comfort food. In the book A Treasury of White House Cooking, Francois Rissavi said, Abraham Lincoln dined in a Spartan fashion. One of the few entrees that would tempt Lincoln was chicken fricassee. He liked the chicken cut up in small pieces, fried with seasonings of nutmeg and mace, and served with a gravy made of the chicken drippings. Homemade Italian cooking says that in Abe's time, it would have been made by dredging the chicken in flour and frying them in lard. 
For the gravy, they added cream in addition to the nutmeg and mace. Not the self-defense mace, but rather a spice derived from the dried coating of the nutmeg seed. Then, to really thicken it, a ball of butter coated in flour was added at the end and the whole thing was served over biscuits. Jeez Louise, that all sounds delicious. If you want to try your hand at the food of one of America's most beloved presidents, you can find the recipe online, a luxury Lincoln unfortunately didn't have. Who knows how much sooner the Civil War would have ended if Honest Abe only had access to DoorDash. From strange pie fillings to a serious lack of vegetables, the dangers of medieval fast food are jaw-dropping. While you might think that eating modern-day fast food carries a risk, can you imagine what medieval fast food must have been like? Just as people in modern society often don't have enough time, money, or interest when it comes to making home-cooked meals, those living in medieval times had similar issues. And much like today, their solution to these problems was fast food. Throughout history, people have needed quick, easy, portable food that can effortlessly be consumed on the go. As noted by the Pennsylvania State University Center for Medieval Studies, the concept of fast food has been around since Roman times. Adults living in urban areas in small dwellings often didn't have access to food storage, fuel with which to cook, or tools such as pots, pans, or utensils. Many didn't even have actual meat or vegetables to cook in the first place. As early as the late 12th century, there was a fast food restaurant located on the banks of the Thames River in London. Hungry travelers or city dwellers could stop in at any time, day or night, and find a variety of foods ready to eat at a range of price points. For centuries, it remained relatively rare for people to have access to home cooking necessities. One study of life in 14th century Colchester, England, concluded that just 3% of tax-paying households had their own kitchen. Artisans, workers, and poor widows often lived in dwellings without hearts, let alone cooking stoves. Money had to be reserved for crucial expenses such as rent and milk. As for the kinds of fast food medieval diners enjoyed, according to the Penn State University Center for Medieval Studies, meat pies and pasties were popular. Like a Big Mac, these fold-over crusts were portable and easy to eat on the go. Bread was the mainstay of medieval diets because it was inexpensive, lasted a while, and was made from readily available flour. Fast food consisted of lots of bread products, including hotcakes, pancakes, wafers, pies, and pasties. Furthermore, historians have found evidence of regulations forbidding bakers to charge more than a penny to put a customer's meat into a pastry and bake it. This made it even more of a bargain for people with limited funds. Another similarity between medieval fast food and modern fast food is the bad reputation with which these eateries were saddled. In medieval times, the cooks themselves who prepared and sold these foods were often seen as dirty and dishonest. Sources indicate that some cooks made food from tainted meats, reheated and served days-old pasties that were on the verge of spoiling, and sold beef pasties as venison. To make matters worse, many cooks were reportedly disguising tainted dishes with an abundance of spices and herbs. In William Langland's Middle English poem, Piers Plowman, Cooks are listed as a group regularly punished by authorities because, quote, they poison the people privily and oft. Fast food during that era had questionable preparation practices and wasn't regulated. Today, it's still considered an unhealthy option, though we generally have better food practices now. But whatever social class someone occupied during that time, a meat pie here and there didn't stand a chance against their overall poor diets. So in the long run, those quick eats at Riverside cook shops wouldn't have made much of a difference. The medieval diet was lacking in many areas, and the poor and elite all suffered by not getting adequate vitamins and nutrients for proper bodily functions. It resulted in several health conditions common at the time. 
lucky for the poor, due to social attitudes that said fruits and vegetables were for peasants, they had better access and opportunities to eat them. But another attitude of that time also said that fresh produce couldn't be eaten raw and had to be cooked. This meant that a lot of significant nutrients were lost. For the most part, the medieval diet mostly consisted of what we call carbohydrates today. But even with the health risks that came with their food practices, some experts say it fares better than what people actually eat today. At its best, Thanksgiving is a reminder to think back on the things we love. At its worst, Thanksgiving is an excuse to eat just disgusting amounts of food. But how did we get to this point? Here's the untold truth of Thanksgiving. The history of Thanksgiving is long and murky. Most Americans trace the celebration of Thanksgiving to a celebratory feast the pilgrims had in 1621 alongside their native allies, the Wampanoags. But some feel that's an arbitrary starting point, both because native tribes already had their own much older traditions of giving thanks, and because the first English colonizers to have a ceremonial Thanksgiving feast were actually the settlers in Jamestown, Virginia in 1610. Jamestown curator Mary Outlaw thinks the reason this Thanksgiving is forgotten is because of the ghastly backstory. During a terrible winter, over 80% of Jamestown's 300 settlers died in what is known as the Starving Time. To survive, the increasingly desperate colonists resorted to eating rats, horses, shoe leather, and ultimately human flesh. The famished few who lived were saved by British ships bearing food. The resulting Thanksgiving celebration has sort of been papered over thanks to that whole cannibalism thing. In 1619, Virginia had another Thanksgiving service when Starving Time survivor Captain John Woodleaf journeyed to the Berkeley settlement on business. The second celebration is the one Virginia tend to recognize as the first American Thanksgiving, and probably will until Soylent Green finally replaces turkey as the main Thanksgiving dish. You gotta tell him, Soylent Green is people! The peace and harmony between the pilgrims and the natives didn't last long. By 1623, just two years after the famous Thanksgiving feast, tensions had broken out. Tensions that would lead to a terrible betrayal at another feast of friendship. Captain Miles Standish, a short soldier with an even shorter temper, often did the pilgrims dirty work. Suspicious and paranoid that the local native tribes were planning to attack a group of colonizers who had been stealing native food, Standish invited Wittawamit and Pexuit, two of the native leaders, to a private feast inside a hut to discuss matters. It was a trick. Once the natives were inside the hut, the pilgrims barred the door and then set upon Wittawamit and Pexuit, stabbing them to death. Other natives were hunted down and hung. Standish then cut off Wittawamit's head and mounted it on a pike in Plymouth as a warning. The warning worked all too well. Afraid that the English would murder them, many native tribes left their villages and fled. Unable to tend their crops, they went hungry, and hundreds of natives, including some of the pilgrims' closest allies, died of starvation as a result. Thanksgiving brings families together, which often means a lot of arguments and uncomfortable situations. I'd like us all to remember Grandma. I'm sure mm -hmm. she's looking down on us and smiling. Mm -hmm. yep. I hope it's the version of her before she was in the grips of dementia. <laughs> <laughs> but long before your family was having their annual civil war around the dining table, Thanksgiving became a divisive issue in the lead-up to the actual civil war. Not yet a national holiday in the mid-1800s, Thanksgiving was primarily celebrated in New England, which had by then become the center of the abolitionist movement. According to the LA Times, several pro-slavery states embraced Thanksgiving during the 1840s. But by the 1850s, tensions over slavery had intensified, and Thanksgiving had grown in popularity across northern states. As a result, places like Virginia refused to celebrate it. Multiple papers slammed the so-called abolitionist holiday, with one calling it little more than an occasion for indulgence and dissipation at the cost of character, health, and slenderly provided purses. In 1863, following victories by Union armies at Gettysburg and Vicksburg, President Lincoln called for an end to the war and declared Thanksgiving a national celebration. Now, if only Lincoln were around to mediate your family dinners. Meanwhile, our northern neighbor Canada has its own national day of gratitude. Like the Yankee version, it includes family get-togethers and scrumptious meals, so it might seem like a copycat. But actually, the roots of the Canadian Thanksgiving go back even further than the American one, all the way back to 1578. It was in that year that an English pirate named Martin Frobisher set anchor off the coast of Newfoundland. An explorer who became famous for plundering French trading vessels, Frobisher and his men took refuge on Newfoundland. To celebrate their success, they commemorated the moment with a Thanksgiving celebration, the first known Thanksgiving held by Europeans in America. Frobisher eventually died fighting the Spanish, but his journey lived on in Canadian lore, and the country officially adopted Thanksgiving as an annual celebration in 1879. 
Playing and watching football on Thanksgiving is a tradition that goes back almost as far as the national holiday itself, with games sprouting up just a few years after Lincoln's 1863 declaration. Unfortunately, though, it hasn't always been all fun, as the love of Thanksgiving football led to the worst disaster of a sporting event in American history. In the 1890s, Stanford University and UC Berkeley developed a spirited gridiron rivalry playing every Thanksgiving. According to Stanford Magazine, in those days, the competitions were exclusively held in San Francisco, with crowds much larger than the stadium could accommodate. In 1897, thousands of fans climbed onto the roof of the stands, which collapsed. But miraculously, no one was killed and only one person had to be hospitalized. Nobody learned their lesson, though. Three years later, in the year 1900, hundreds of fans who couldn't get seats climbed onto the roof of a nearby factory. It collapsed and dozens of people fell more than 50 feet, some landing on top of a 500-degree industrial furnace. 23 people died, most of them children and young men, with countless more injured and maimed. A grand jury eventually ruled that it was their own fault for being on the roof in the first place. These days, everyone in America is so used to celebrating Thanksgiving on the fourth Thursday of November that we just take it for granted. That's how it's always been, right? Well, actually, no, and the change wasn't an easy one. When Abraham Lincoln made Thanksgiving an official holiday back in 1863, he proclaimed that it would take place on the last Thursday in November. This tradition lasted for decades, but during the Depression, retailers began agitating for an earlier Thanksgiving in order to give them a longer Christmas shopping season. So in 1939, President Franklin D. Roosevelt officially changed Thanksgiving to the fourth Thursday in November instead of the last one. And people were not happy about it. Of the 48 states, 16 decided to stick with the last Thursday of the month anyway, while Texas and Colorado decided to have it both ways by celebrating both Thanksgivings, two weeks in a row. Some declared the new date an imposter, calling it Franksgiving after FDR. This went on for two years, during which obesity rates probably quadrupled in Texas and Colorado. Kids love playing dress-up, which is partly why Halloween is so popular. And strange as it sounds, Thanksgiving used to be an occasion for kids to dress up in costume and go door-to-door -door trick or treating. Yes, it's strange, but true. From the late 19th century through the first half of the 20th century, kids went out in costumes on Turkey Day, with an 1897 LA Times piece calling it, quote, the busiest time of the year for manufacturers of and dealers in masks and false faces. People in New York even called Thanksgiving Ragamuffin Day because so many people dressed as beggars and stood on the streets asking for goodies. By the 1940s, though, times had changed and the practice died out. But if you ever go trick-or-treating and receive a bag of gravy, you'll know why. Norman Rockwell's iconic 1943 painting, Freedom from Want, perfectly captures the quintessential view of a classic American Thanksgiving meal around the family dinner table. And it should, because it was largely responsible for creating that idea in the first place. That's because Freedom from Want wasn't art imitating life. It was art trying to sell patriotism to drum up support for America's efforts in World War II. And to do that, Rockwell imagined a scene that actually wasn't that common for most of Thanksgiving history up to that point. In fact, back in the day, most people celebrated Thanksgiving dinner by dining out at pantry fancy restaurants. If possible, many even celebrated Thanksgiving dinner on cruise ships. It wasn't until the Great Depression of the 1930s that people started having Thanksgiving dinner at home because they just didn't have the money to keep eating out. Freedom from want worked, though, and worked so well that it still remains the image most people have of what Thanksgiving dinner is and should be. For many Americans, Thanksgiving is about appreciating the present and honoring a mythical past. Their day of grateful gluttony pays vague homage to bygone figures from a 17th century feast steeped in wholesome imagery and wholesome revisionism. But others are haunted by the ghost of Thanksgiving past and atrocities that followed, as the peaceful Plymouth meal that we often associate with Thanksgiving was the precursor to decades of slavery, sickness, and genocide. According to Smithsonian Magazine, approximately 300,000 Native Americans in New England alone met violent ends at the hands of Europeans, and even more were dis placed. Understandably, many Native Americans know Thanksgiving not as a holiday, but as the day of mourning, or un-Thanksgiving day. Native American actor Michael Horse of Twin Peaks fame told Newsweek that instead of feasting, he and others attend a ceremony in remembrance of a three-year occupation of Alcatraz Island aimed at turning it and its famous prison into a Native American cultural center. He said, It's about reflecting, remembering, and celebrating that we are still here and our culture still survives. The White House tradition of pardoning donated turkeys officially started in 1989 with President George H.W. Bush, but the idea predates his administration. In fact, when JFK showed mercy to a turkey in 1963, the Washington Post called it a pardon. But it's not all fun and games. Because many Thanksgiving turkeys are overfed so they will provide more dinner meats, getting a presidential pardon doesn't necessarily mean a long life of retirement for the lucky bird. 
For instance, at least two of the butterballs rescued from President Obama's dinner table were eight times bigger than the average wild turkey, so they probably died prematurely due to morbid obesity. And that's not even accounting for the intentional cruelty perpetrated by the president himself. Vietnam War villain Richard Nixon, a notorious turkey who received an actual presidential pardon after Watergate, once had a live turkey's feet nailed to a table in order to restrain it. It might have been kinder just to eat it. Nowadays, we know Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, as a time to go shop until you drop. Or at least shop until someone drops you with a roundhouse kick to the face for grabbing that last PlayStation 5. But though the urban legend claims that the term Black Friday refers to the fact that retailers have their best sales day of the year and thus are in the black, the actual reason for the name is less happy. The original Black Friday took place in 1869, when a scheme to artificially inflate the price of gold almost plunged America into a crippling depression. Then, in 1929, the stock market crash that began on Black Thursday and continued through Black Tuesday started an actual Great Depression that would last for more than a decade. This kind of naming convention continues to this day, with Black Monday stock market crashes taking place in 1987, 2008, and 2020. So if Black Friday historically refers to an economic disaster, why is it applied to the most profitable and dangerous shopping day of the year? Well, it started out as a sarcastic joke in the 1950s, as retailers began having so many of their employees call out sick on the day after Thanksgiving that they took to calling it Black Friday. The term really began catching on in 1966 when Philadelphia police used it to describe the chaos of the shopping experience on the day after Thanksgiving. As a result, people began actually staying away from the stores because the Black Friday nickname made it sound too scary to go shopping. It was retail executive Peter Strawbridge who reportedly flipped the script by coming up with the alternative narrative about business profits being in the black, a neat bit of advertising that is still working to this day. Alcohol was used for survival in the 1800s. Kids younger than 18 used to drink seven gallons of it per year. So why is alcohol barred against anyone younger than 21? And is your state one of the few who's considering switching the law around? Keep watching to find out. The United States of America is nearly unique among other countries of the world in that its legal drinking age is 21. By comparison, just about all of Western Europe, most of South America, and most of Sub-Saharan Africa have a legal drinking age of 18 or lower, among other places. These variations have to do with local drinking cultures, the ages of which different cultures believe people are legally adults who are capable of making their own decisions, and a host of other factors. In the U.S., the legal drinking age has been all over the place over the centuries, from non-existent to 18 to 21 and just about everything in between. Officially, there's no federal law mandating a legal drinking age of 21 in all 50 states. The de facto legal drinking age of 21 exists because the federal government holds the purse strings. This is because a law passed in 1984 ties federal highway funds to setting the minimum legal drinking age, known as the MLDA, at 21. There was a time in American history when, save for a few teetotalers, just about everybody drank, including male children. The early colonists pretty much had to drink beer in order to stay alive, as beer contains calories which are absolutely critical when food is scarce. Further still, the alcohol within kills microorganisms that could be contained in water and might sicken the drinker, although it would be centuries before anyone connected the microbiological dots. According to PBS, by 1830, Americans were guzzling alcohol to the point that even 15-year-old boys were knocking back seven gallons per year, about three times what the average American adult drinks today. Prohibition put an end to all of that, but it didn't really stop anyone from drinking. What it did do was shine a light on matters of alcohol abuse and related issues. When Prohibition was repealed, the states, keen to keep kids and teens away from alcohol, began setting their own MLDAs. The result was a mismatch of conflicting state laws that existed until 1984. There were MLDA laws prior to Prohibition, though. For example, Wisconsin passed a law in 1839 that made it illegal to sell wine or liquor to anyone under 18. After Prohibition, the laws could change dramatically when you cross state lines, but the law became a little more consistent around the late 1960s and early 1970s. That's when the 26th Amendment was passed, which lowered the voting age to 18 and the states figured that if people were old enough to vote at 18, they were old enough to drink at 18, too. During the years in which states began lowering their drinking ages to 18, the U.S. saw a dramatic increase in traffic accidents among teenagers. This and other factors led to the National Minimum Age Drinking Act of 1984, which set the MLDA at 21 in all 50 states. The act doesn't specifically set the minimum drinking age at 21. If it did, there would be thorny constitutional issues related to state sovereignty and interstate commerce. Instead, it withholds federal highway funds from those states that don't comply. 
All 50 states have therefore set their MLDA to 21, although there are exceptions and slight variations from state to state. Four decades after the passage of the National Minimum Age Drinking Act, some states are wrestling with whether or not keeping their drinking age at 21 is working. For example, New Jersey, New Hampshire, and California have all taken a second look at their drinking laws in recent years. When you're capable of buying a house or whatever, the idea that you're somehow incapable of determining whether to buy a six-pack is profoundly silly. The debate itself is both philosophical and practical. In a philosophical sense, if someone is considered an adult at age 18, then why shouldn't they be able to imbibe? However, in a practical sense, the statistics don't lie, and the data points to lives being saved by keeping the legal drinking age at 21. Those keen to see the age lowered to 18 posit that the higher age just leads to binge drinking and fake IDs, however. Further, it costs states revenue from taxes on alcohol sales, as well as putting young people into legal trouble simply for trying to have a good time. Either way, it seems like this debate is set to continue for some time yet. The Rolling Stones are one of the most influential rock bands of all time, and that influence extends far beyond the music industry. In fact, one of their lesser-known legacies is the band's popularization of a certain iconic cocktail. In June of 1972, the Stones had just set out on their American tour promoting the album Exile on Main Street, starting with a series of shows on the west coast of North America, kicking off the California leg of the tour in San Francisco and moving down toward San Diego. The band was nervous about touring California, however, after the horrific and tragic events at the Altamont Speedway concert in 1969. In the midst of that show, the Hells Angels recruited to act as security became violent, leading to the killing of one young fan. To help the group relax before making their way down the coast, concert promoter Bill Graham rented out the Trident restaurant in Sausalito for a private party. A bartender named Bobby Lozoff was working there, and as the bar had a juicer, he was experimenting with making cocktails using fresh juices. When Mick Jagger approached Lozoff and asked for a margarita, Lozoff asked if he'd like to try something he'd been working on instead. Bobby Lozoff had been particularly interested in serving tequila cocktails because Sausalito had become a popular stopover for people running marijuana out of Mexico and into San Francisco. Lozoff once remembered, myself and a bartender called Billy Rice started experimenting. Anything made with gin or vodka, we started making with tequila. First named by a 1930s bartender at the Arizona Biltmore Hotel, the Tequila Sunrise is a riff on the Singapore sling, only made with tequila instead of gin. Lozoff offered Jagger the drink, which consisted of tequila, fresh orange juice, sweet and sour mix, soda, and grenadine, and the Stones frontman loved it. It was a magic night. Everybody was thrilled. Everybody was jazzed. Nothing got broken. Lozoff later recalled, Mick came up to the bar and asked for a margarita. I asked him if he had ever tried a tequila sunrise. He said no. I built him one and they started sucking them up. After that, they took them all across the country. The Rolling Stones were such fans of the cocktail that the ingredients for tequila sunrises became requirements on the band's tour riders and had to be delivered to their dressing rooms before each show. Promoters reportedly received a letter regarding the band's drink preferences that noted, it would be very strange to see Keith Richards in top form without the company of a good tequila. In his 2010 autobiography Life, Keith Richards even referred to the 1972 cross-country tour as the Cocaine and Tequila Sunrise Tour. Once word got out that the drink was a favorite of none other than the Rolling Stones, the Tequila Sunrise took off across the United States, and soon people were ordering it everywhere. Articles about the Rolling Stones included copious references to the band drinking them during interviews and press conferences. The Tucson Daily Citizen even ran a Tequila Sunrise recipe right before a Rolling Stones show in the city. Soon, other rock bands got in on the trend. In 1973, the Eagles released the adult contemporary Top 40 hit song, Tequila Sunrise, which both Johnny Winter and Rick Derringer followed up with re-recordings of the single, Cheap Tequila. However, as the drink's popularity spread throughout the country, bartenders ran into a problem. The beverage, which traditionally called for fresh-squeezed orange juice, was now being ordered in places far removed from the tropical locales where oranges grow. Instead, they had to turn to store-bought Tropicana, or the somewhat less popular Minute Maid, in order to try to capitalize on the Sunrise's growing popularity. 
While the Tequila Sunrise might have fallen out of fashion since its glory days in the 1970s, this sweet, fruity citrus drink might well be due for a comeback. In 2015, Jose Cuervo ran a commercial and later created a commemorative tequila bottle paying tribute to the tour that became legend, the drink that fueled it.